Hello, today is March the 11th of 2021. My name is Anthony Trevino and I'm interviewing Gloria Ramirez for the University of Library Special Collections and Archives at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Hereafter abbreviated as eCharge V, this project is in partnership with the, Vos the VOSIS Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Please know Mrs. Ramirez that this interview will be placed in the University of Library Special Collections and Archives at UTRGV and shared with the VOSIS Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. If there is anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I will honor the, your wishes. Also, if there's something you want to talk about, please bring it up and we'll talk about it. The University Library Special Collections and Archives will archive your interview and along with any other photographs and other documentation you are willing to share. Each RGV University Library will retain copyright or non-exclusive right to interview and any other materials you donate to Special Collections and Archives at Each RGV. Because we are not conducting this interview in person, I need to re record your consenting to make sure you agree with our interview procedures before we continue. So I'll ask you a series of six questions. Please say, yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree after each question. Okay, I'm gonna ask you the first question. Do you give University Library Special Collections and Archives at UTRGV consent to archive your interview and your materials at the UTRGV University Library? Yes, yes, I do. Okay. Do you grant UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives right title and interest in copyright over the interview and any materials you provide? Yes. Okay. Do you agree to allow UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes. Do you grant the University Library Special Collections and Archives consent to share your Zoom interview with the Voices Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin for inclusion in the Voices of a Pandemic Oral History Mini Project, which will include posting the interview on the internet. Yes. Okay. As you recall, we previously filled out a pre-interview form. We use this information from the pre-interview form to help in research. The entire form is kept in secure Voices server at the University at Texas before Voices census. Um, special collection archives. We would have stripped out any information for yourself or family members that you would not be part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at UTRG Media University. The final two questions I ask you for consent on what I just described. And give me a second. Okay. Do you wish for us to share the rest of your interview in your public file available to researchers at UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives? Yes. On occasion, UTRGV Special Collections and Archives and Voices receive requests from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects. We only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you give consent for us to share your phone numbers or email with journalists? Yes. Okay, thank you for your consent. Your experiences and stories means a lot to us at UTRGV Special Collections and Archives. I look forward to what you say in any of your questions. I will now ask. Okay. okay. And, all right, again, Gloria, thank you for your time. Like I said earlier, your stories and experiences are val valuable to us at UTRGV Special Collections and Archives and the Voices Project. Particularly for us at UTRGV Special Collections, we are committed to preserving the stories of Mexican, Americans, and Latinos from South Texas and the Rio Grande Valley, and those who work closely with the population. During the COVID-19 pandemic, because you are so close to your family who cares for the physical safety and mental well-being of those that you love and those in the community of McAllen, Texas, and because you are a daughter, sister, and a friend who is knowledgeable of ways COVID-19 has affected others, in her inner circle. I know you have many meaningful stories and experiences to share on how COVID-19 has impacted these roles you carry out in your life. All right, so before anything, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to share stories about your life in this pandemic and just uh, tell us who, who is Gloria Ramirez? Okay, uh, I'm Gloria Ramirez. I'm of Hispanic origin. 
born and raised here in the Rio Grande Valley, Texas. And I'm a faithful believer of God's word. Um, I attended uh, South Texas Community College, received a, a certificate as an activity director. I attended Texas State Technical Institute, received a certificate in a, uh, as a nurse assistant. And I attended the Natural School of uh, Thera Massage Therapy, where I received a state license in massage therapy. I also attended uh, Pan American University uh, in 1980. Okay, wow. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, so the first question I want to ask you is, when did you first hear about COVID-19? I first heard about COVID-19 or what they were calling it at the time, the coronavirus on TV, um, in the news, and uh, also through social media. That's where I first heard about it. Okay. And what was your first reaction to the information about COVID? Um, I was very concerned um, and wondered if it was uh, perhaps one of the plagues of, of one of many plagues that uh, the Bible speaks about. Uh, I, I was concerned for my family, my close friends, and um, the severity of, of, the, of, of getting contaminated uh, uh, with this virus, um, uh, as they were talking about how easily it could be contracted. Right. Exactly. And uh, at what at what point did you re realize this pandemic was was a serious life altering event, or did you not think it was uh, not serious? I I always. Um, I thought it was serious. Uh, I thought if the CDC and the president was bringing it to our attention, I I believe that uh, we we should be concerned about it, and that's and I began to listen more and more about it as uh, as more information um, was updated about this virus and. Um, and uh, drew even more concern about it because uh, we began to hear people uh, here in the valley uh, uh, contracting the illness, um, even getting hospitalized and, and then right. even dying from it. Right. And, um, and then being that it's uh, been over more than a year with COVID, can you share with me what you understood about COVID as an infectious disease and any of its uh, variants? Um, what I've learned from this, uh, from the media, from the news, uh, I've learned that uh, this can be contracted from person to person, uh, even within six feet from another person. Um, I've heard that it can be contracted uh, uh, through droplets in the air, um, uh, even in close proximity of, uh, 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 of a group of people or in a restaurant. Um, and um, uh, that's, um, that's what I've learned of uh, how you could contract this, right. this virus. Right, and are there any, any like uh, things you still don't understand about it yet, or? Um, uh, I still listen to the news uh, uh, and try to get updates on, on what the scientists are investigating. And from what we know and still don't understand, is its origin, where it came from originally. Uh, they speak about bats and, and uh, or perhaps it was uh, man-made in a lab 
So uh, we right. still don't have those answers. Right. Um, can you tell me about what you know about various vaccines available to the public? And how do you feel about these uh, vaccines that are being introduced? Um, I know the, the Pfizer and the Moderna uh, have been administered to millions of people already. Uh, I've heard of the AstraZeneca still being uh, in presidented. Uh, I've also heard of the Johnson and Johnson vaccine uh which was still somewhat questionable but now being administered it's only um uh uh 66 66% proof that i know of uh versus uh, the pfizer and the moderna are 90% right um those those are the vaccines that i know of Okay. 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 And um, would you happen to have a vaccination story? Would you like to share with me, or now, or per perhaps later in this interview? Um, I I don't have a vaccine story other than um, uh, uh, we my husband and I have gotten vaccinated. We we just received the second dose about two weeks ago. Um, uh, we both were sore on the arms. My husband did, uh, he did uh, uh, experience a little bit more than I did. He was, he woke up at three in the morning. He felt his arms swollen. His chest was hurting. Um, he took some Tylenol the next day. He was perfectly fine. We were both per perfectly fine. Okay, that's good. And um, just kind of like a little more about your family. Um, do your family members hold the same beliefs as you about COVID-19? Or are there some who take it more seriously or lightly? Um, we, my husband and I took uh, the, the news of this uh, uh, coronavirus uh, that's now called COVID-19, we took it seriously at the beginning. Uh, we decided to wear masks, uh, use hand sanitizer. Uh, my, uh, my daughters and my grandchildren weren't taking it so seriously because there was a lot of uh, skeptical information in the news about it not being real or over overly exaggerated about the about the ways you or the ways you can't get uh, COVID. Um, and so um, um, in the beginning it, it they did not take it as seriously as we did. Um, okay. And uh, when was the moment you realized this was a serious matter for you? And how did you react to it? Um, uh, like I said, I, I took it seriously at the beginning. And when we, we, we became more concerned was when we started to hear about people in the valley contracting the virus, uh, becoming sick. Uh, hospitalized and even dying from this virus. Um, uh, that's when we became more concerned for our families and close friends. Okay, okay. Being that we just talked about uh, different types of vaccines, um, coming back from to that topic, um, what convinced you um, to get the vaccine, and and after how long uh, did you did it take you to get it when it came out? Well, we were advised um, that the vaccine was not a good idea. Uh, it was made uh, too quickly. It hadn't been tested long enough. Uh, 
and uh, uh, could possibly have future uh, side effects uh, um, uh, and, 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 and we were concerned about that. Uh, uh, we at the beginning decided not to take the vaccine for that reason. Um, we prayed about it and uh, after uh, months and months of thinking about it and uh, because of our age, we decided um, to go ahead and, and get the vaccine. And um, we realized that other vaccines such as the polio, the measles and um, other vaccines that have helped the community, um, uh, the possibility of, of this one, uh, we just had to take a chance and, and rely on the source of the Lord that we'll be okay. Um, and taking it, and we did, and we're okay with having taken it. That's good, thank you. Um, for these next set of questions, I want to get into some deeper questions on how COVID has affected you and your family. Being that it has affect us, affected us all, it is important to know your story and how really you helped your family and your community in the deep South Texas area and what impacts it may have had in your, your life during the pandemic. So being that said, here's um, the first question. In your family, did they, they carry the strong concern towards us as you, or was it, again, not taken so seriously, you know, as uh, we move forward uh, till now? Um, well, like I said, at the beginning, my daughters and grandchildren weren't, um, uh, taking the precautions that, that we were. Uh, my oldest daughter was uh, at the time in the middle of uh, uh, looking for another job. And when in June of last year, during the time where the, the pandemic had uh, started, um, uh, all of a sudden, uh, the call center that she wanted to transfer to or work at, uh, many positions became available. Now, many positions became available because a lot of people, employees there had contracted the virus. At the time, the state, it wasn't uh, state required that the employers let the public know uh, uh, who had the virus or there were people there who had contracted it at their business. And uh, my daughter took a position there at that uh, call center and contracted the virus. There was no CDC protocol, uh, uh, no announcements by the state uh, uh, enforcing employers to let the public know uh, of people who were sick there. And uh, it became a very crucial time for the family. Um, she was the first to have contracted it in June of 2019 and had it for almost a month. Uh, she went through a grueling uh, 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 time because she didn't want to lose her job. She has COVID-19. She's working with COVID-19. She can hardly breathe. She's working as an operator, making appointments for people in the United States who had COVID-19, who needed appointments uh, with their doctors. Uh, this was a very trying time for her as well as us. We did not know any of this information until she was completely healed from this virus. She could not disclose any of this to us because she was very sick. She couldn't breathe, she couldn't talk. She wanted to hang on to her job to pay rent. And um, we were doing, we were at God's mercy. We were leaving food at her door. We were taking turns, uh, 
taking vitamins, everything we could think of possibly that she could need, looking for resources online uh, to take to her. It was a very trying time for the family. Um, uh, later, uh, uh, not only that, she went through the humiliation of the city sending the CDC through her to her door uh, where she had to come out with her mask and sign paperwork, letting the city know that she was uh, she was uh, giving and telling them she would not leave the premises until the CDC released her. After that, none of this was done to other people who got COVID. And I believe that all that um, formality stopped because the pandemic became so overwhelmed in the community, there was not enough staff to go door to door. Uh, 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 to to uh, do that documentation. Um, she was finally released after a month. And then in June of uh, 2000, um, January of 2020, uh, my daughter, Adriana and uh, my uh, my granddaughter and her husband contracted COVID, hospitalized, they recovered. And um, again, it was a very trying and difficult time for the family as they these were the only ones that contracted the virus here in Texas. We did have other families in another state that did contract it and overcame it as well. Oh, wow. Um, what, what were some ways you would help your family with uh, during the pandemic? We would take food to her door. Again, we would take vitamins, uh, teas, anything that we could find online. We would listen to the news, uh, Good Morning America, to Dr. J. Her, um, she had a lot of uh, resources. Uh, and a list of, of things that we could give a loved one or friends who had contracted it, uh, like teas for the respiratory, people were having problems breathing, um, uh, uh, anything we could think of, uh, Tylenol and uh, food, water, anything uh, to help her cope as she could not leave uh, and, and my my two daughters could not leave the premises uh, when they contracted it. So family members took uh, turns taking hot meals, cooked meals, as well as groceries and medications to help overcome this this virus. And uh, how how long did it take uh, before you could actually see your your daughter? And what did it feel like not being able to like be there and see them while they're going through COVID? Um, for our protection, as as well as theirs, uh, we we didn't see each other for um, many months. Uh, um, perhaps uh, 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 eight, eleven months before we actually saw each other. My daughter did not want us in the apartment, even with a mask, because they had they were sick at one time with COVID. They were afraid of, of uh, us contracting. Since we're elderly, they were fearful. So we waited uh, a very long time before we could actually see them. And uh, actually, uh, never uh, giving hugs uh, till this past last year with mask on, of course. Right. And did you find it hard not to, to see those individuals? Very difficult. It was very painful. Um, 
We communicated through the phone. Um, uh, and that was the extent of it. Uh, sometimes if we dropped something off, they'd wave at the door. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it was again, the same for my parents who were elderly. Um, it was a wave at the door um, uh, or from the car. Uh, we had drive-by birthdays uh, that were very painful uh, emotionally. Um, we couldn't hug. And um, we, for the first time, celebrated Easter and seeing each other for the first time without mask uh, this year. Wow. Yeah. Okay, um, going into another subject, more, more of you. Um, what was it like to travel during the pandemic? Uh, were you more cautious or where, where did you travel as well? Uh, we, we only traveled uh, uh, to our local beach, which is an hour from here. Uh, took many precautions. We used masks. Uh, we had to take hand sanitizers, uh, our own bedding, our own towels and blankets. Uh, very inconvenient. Uh, we disinfect the hotel room so much that we had to leave the hotel until the Lysol settled because we couldn't breathe with all the disinfectants. We, we had to clean every and everything inside the hotel. Uh, all the handles and everything. Uh, we never ate out. Everything was uh, brought, uh, bought from the store, from the restaurant. Uh, and even then we dis disinfected the, the paper, the package that it came in. Okay, and excuse me a sec. What was it like working through the pandemic? Uh, my husband and I are retired. Uh, so we, we didn't uh, have to, uh, but uh, we, we always had the concern for our families and friends who had to work, our grandchildren, our daughters. Um, uh, so uh, we stayed home. Um, we went to the groceries, came home, and that was the extent of uh, uh, that was the extent of our lives. Go just going to the grocery store and coming home. Okay, okay. Um, sorry, give me a second. Um, and uh, what were some activities you would do during the pandemic to keep you to keep you busy? Uh, during the time we were in the middle of moving, so we moved into our new home, we were very consumed uh, and overwhelmed with moving, selling our home and moving into a new home, uh, unpacking. Uh, we, we passed the time with uh, putting things away, um, uh, I myself uh, crafting, um, and uh, uh, just finding things to do around the house and um, uh, getting updates on, on what was going on with COVID on the news, uh, communicating with families, making sure everybody was fine. And um, uh, a lot of praying, a lot of sharing uh, with social media on getting updates and and uh, and and uh, just finding things to do uh, okay. to keep our minds uh, emotionally stable through this crisis. Right, right. And uh, and what was life for uh, before COVID for you? Um, I believe, like like us and many, we took life for granted. Many who didn't know the Lord know the Lord now. Unfortunately, many have lost their lives. Um, we, 
we didn't we didn't use the mask. We I personally did have hand san hand sanitizer in my car all the time. I've been doing this for years. Um, but uh, we took life for granted. It was uh, more carefree. Uh, we didn't pay attention to um, uh, um, the the concerns of catching anything. You right. caught a flu, you went to the doctor, you got medication for it. Uh, and uh, uh, it was a very carefree um, lifestyle we were all living in. Right. Right. And uh, well, as you, keep, uh, as you mentioned, you have this strong relation towards God. And you mentioned in our pre-interview as well. well what was it like? being a believer during the pandemic? Um, well, as a believer, as a faithful believer, and even when the COVID uh, crisis started, uh, we knew uh, if we caught the virus, it was in our, in our, in our plan God had for us. Uh, we were okay with leaving this earth, uh, having contracted virus. Uh, we hoped and prayed we wouldn't get it uh, and took all the precautionary measures uh, one should take and um, advised our, 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 our daughters and our, our grandchildren the same way. Um, uh, we went to church online because the church is closed. It became very difficult for us because we were used to fellowshipping with other people. We were used to doing uh, gatherings and parties and socializing and sharing Bible studies. That all came to a halt. Um, we were doing church online. This became very difficult for my husband. He could not sit with me anymore. Uh, he struggled emotionally. And that's when we decided to look for a church. At that moment, after months of watching, um, uh, attending church online, we decided uh, enough's enough. There's got to be a church open. We found a church. Uh, and um, my husband remembered uh, a gentleman we had met a few years ago um, uh, who talked about his church in FAR, and uh, we looked it up. His church was open, and uh, we've been attending since. They, to this day, take precautionary measures. They have lamps in their church that kill bacteria, but people still wear their masks. They still sanitize the chairs. They, they do the hand check with a, uh, the hand temperature check with the monitors. And uh, um, we're, they're still taking the, the precautionary measures uh, and not to spread uh, this virus. Right, right. Would you say, uh, would you say that uh, many also became believers during the pandemic? And maybe why, why so? I believe and witnessed many became believers. Uh, many who didn't attend church, attend church now, or attend, attend church uh, online. Um, uh, many we witnessed on social media spoke about how they, they never prayed they never went to church, are now praying. Uh, many of them lost their loved ones to COVID. And because of that, they have turned to Christ. They have, uh, they are now attending church. Um, many uh, that we know of uh, don't, uh, don't turn to Christ, don't pray, don't believe in the Lord, 
and still are, are living a, a reckless life. Um, there's consequences to that uh, before and after COVID. Um, and um, uh, we're, we've seen the big changes uh, in, in both. Uh, the non-believers and the new believers. We're, we're, we're seeing this drastic uh, change in the world uh, before our eyes in, in both. Right. Exactly. And um, we're going on to our next question. Um, it's, a, it's one deep question. It's kind of relating back to your family members, like you said, that several of them um, um, contacted the virus, contracted the virus, and um, have you ever um, experienced someone that passed away by COVID? Um, friends that that we haven't seen for many, many years, uh, high school friends, we learned uh, people that we knew, uh, we learned that uh, passed uh, through social media. Uh, that's how we learned uh, they passed. Uh, fortunately, nobody in the immediate family has contracted uh, COVID and, and passed away. Uh, although um, uh, second cousins from my father uh, have passed away, uh, uh, we personally did not know them. My dad has not seen them in many years. And, uh, but uh, it's been painful for everybody, for people that you did know and didn't know, it's been painful. We're just fortunately that nobody close to us has uh, uh, passed from contracting the COVID. Uh, we are truly blessed that the Lord healed my daughters and her husband and her child, as well as my two grandsons from this uh, deadly virus. We're just truly and mercifully uh, grateful to Christ for healing them in a, in a, in a very difficult time. Right. And, uh, um, how was it, I, I'm not sure if you have, but how was it like going to funerals during the pandemic or how might would have been for other families going to funerals for their loved ones that had passed? Um, I personally did not go to any funeral uh, during uh, the pandemic. Um, I recently attended one uh, a couple of weeks ago, but when the pandemic was was uh, very um, strong, um, when there was no vaccines and people were dying, here in the Rio Grande Valley, it was, and I'm sure as it was in many other states, uh, very, very, uh, very disturbing. Uh, on the news, they showed uh, overwhelming funeral homes with uh, people stacked on top of each other because there was no room uh, to put them in. There was no more refrigerated uh, rooms to put them in. Um, uh, here, uh, it was the same. Many people were deprived of funerals. Um, Having spoke to the director myself two weeks ago, she disclosed to me that many people uh, did not get the opportunity that many people are getting now where they're getting proper funerals, they're getting viewings uh, and, and uh, three-day services where before uh, there was no viewing at all. From the hospital, they were sent to the funeral home and they were buried immediately. Um, uh, they had uh, refrigerated trailers outside of the hospitals to keep these bodies because the funeral homes were, were full and couldn't take any more. 
the lady disclosed to me the, the burials were back to back, back to back, uh, some taking more than two weeks to bury after they had been in their funeral home uh, for some time. Um, it was just a very tragic and disturbing time for people who were burying uh, loved ones and, and more disturbing for those uh, emotionally, for those who didn't get to say goodbye to their loved ones who were dying in the hospitals, uh, who couldn't speak anymore and uh, who saw them for the last time, uh, maybe uh, through FaceTime, through a nurse or maybe not even at all. It was a very difficult, disturbing, emotional time for everybody who witnessed this on social media and on the news. Right. Well, I uh, thank you. I thank you for the, the answer and I agree. Now, now to close, um, I'm gonna ask you some final questions. Are you satisfied with the local response to COVID-19 in McAllen, Texas or RGV? Um, I, I, yes and no. Um, many, many businesses were taking this serious. It, did, it took uh, until the state uh, moved in and enforced the mask, uh, enforced the six feet apart from one another uh, to reduce the, the spread of this virus. Um, uh, and many businesses were uh, enforcing this code, but many weren't. When we visited the island, uh, we saw many people without the mask. This was even after the state had enforced it. There were outside bars you could see from the street with people uh, without a mask socializing. And I remember Cameron County being a, a, a very high risk, a very high rate of, in, uh, of, of people getting infected. Uh, uh, people on the beach, uh, uh, in crowds. Um, um, I, uh, I think many people uh, weren't taking it seriously. And um, I believe the bars that were only thinking about uh, uh, making a buck on serving a, a alcohol was more important than the risk of, of getting COVID was, uh, was, very, um, was very sad, very sad. I remember on the news here, see, watching them locally fight for the rights of remaining open or, or uh, uh, being able to open up again. Right. And um, uh, it, it's been a very trying time for all the businesses. Many have closed, many have not reopened because they can't. And um, uh, we still, we still uh, uh, wear our mask, even though the governor has uh, uh, lifted the band of wearing masks. Many businesses, I thank God, uh, like our grocery, local grocery stores, a lot of these business here locally are, are uh, keeping it mandated that you do wear the mask and you do use uh, the hand sanitizer. And what do you feel about um, Texas Governor Greg Abbott um, to, uh, taking off the mask? And I believe at the time that he lifted that band uh, was a very... Uh, a crucial time in the valley, as well it is as, as it was in, in other, other states. I think we were, we're still in the pandemic. Um, being that this is our last and final answer uh, question, are there any other stories or experiences you would like to share with me that I have not asked about? Um, well, um, concerning COVID, 
um, uh, it's still a pandemic. We still have to be concerned. I, uh, I couldn't emphasize that more. More people are still getting infected. There's variants out there in other countries that are coming here that we know of people have already contracted. Uh, just because you have the vaccine doesn't mean you can walk without a mask. You don't, doesn't mean you don't use your hand sanitizer. I think we still need to maintain our protection and uh, before um, we, we uh, uh, take off our mask and uh, stop using hand sanitizers, uh, I believe that we should continue to use hand sanitizers uh, at all times um, and uh, use every and precautionary measure uh, during this time and in the future. Life will never go back to normal. This is the new. We have to be careful. And um, just because you have the vaccine doesn't mean you, you can't catch COVID. Uh, there's new variants, like I said, out there coming from other countries. And uh, we have to uh, continue praying for the world, continue praying for this country. We have to pray for our new president. Uh, we have to pray for the people who are mourning, who are still losing their loved ones to COVID. Right. And um, um, it's a it's a sad situation altogether, um, unfortunately. And um, um, that's what I'd like to leave with everybody who's listening. Okay. Well, Gloria Ramirez, thank you for your participation in the You Charge of Evos' Oral History Project. I, I greatly appreciate everything you've told me, and thank you for, for being a part of this interview. I was happy to share. Thank you. This will conclude our interview. Thank you. Thank you.